Okay, so yeah, we'll get started. So my name is Ryan. Um, I've been at Dropbox for about four years, so I've kind of seen the company grow from a room full of dudes to, uh, I guess, a thriving company with like actual functioning parts. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about, uh, I guess, our notification infrastructure. So we have millions of computers connected to Dropbox right now, and how do we kind of like get those guys to sync as soon as possible? Um, it's an interesting architecture because it kind of like uh, was kind of evolutionary like built. Um, so the first thing we had definitely wasn't great. And over time, we just kind of iterated and got something that um, was pretty cool. So um, definitely feel free to ask questions. Um, just interrupt me if you want to. This, this, is, that, this is that kind of thing. Um, so anyway, before we get started, um, I like to do this thing to kind of like pump the audience up. Are you guys ready to be pumped up? Yeah. Yeah. This is that's good. That was that was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Normally people are just like blank face, like what? Uh, where am I? Um, I'm I'm hungry. Um, so so we'll do some. We'll give away some bonus space. You guys, if you guys use Dropbox, this is your chance to get 500 gigabytes for life. Um, yeah. This is that kind of thing. So. Can I have one? You can, but you have to answer a question first. So I'm going to ask you this question. OK. First question for 500 gigabytes. Who's, who's the father of, like, uh, I guess the father of digital electronics today as we know it? No, not Turing. No. Turing cl close. Babbage is more of like a, a grandfather, maybe a godfather. <laughs> you, you missed out. Like, 500 gigabytes for life. No, close. That, oh, that was really close. Sorry? Uh, no. Nah. Godfather. This is pretty impressive. No, no, but that, no. No, someone already said Turing. Nyquist? Oh, Nyquist is not digital electronics, but. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody? This guy is, this guy is like why we're here. Um, there's no wrong answers. Uh, what? Ryan Hunter. No. <laughs> <laughs> This is a really good crowd. You know what? You just get 100 gigabytes. Dude, it's yours. Meet me after. Um, yeah. Not Al Gore. Not Al Gore. Uh, no. Yes. Bam. Did it. 500 gigabytes. Nice. Give him a round of applause. He did it. <laughs> What's your name? What? what? What is your name? Lynn. Thanks, Lynn. That's, that's good. Did you just Google on your phone? Or, yeah. OK, whatever. <laughs> You were the smartest one. Um, I mean, so, uh, one more question just to even the playing field, give someone else a chance. 500 gigabytes. We'll say, yeah, 500 gigabytes. Oh, uh, no, no. We'll go down. Um, 250, just because the time, the time is like uh, making it worse. Uh, uh, what's, what's another good question? Who, who wrote the first, first compiler? What we know today as a compiler? Yep, you did it. That was good. All right. So I don't know if this is if this is common knowledge anymore. Who knew that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. So we'll get started. Thanks, thanks, guys, for participating. Um, I think the history of computing is really important. I feel like everyone should know that stuff because, kind of like Carl Sagan, that way, like <clears throat> knowing kind of how these things are built is kind of more inspiring because. You get a sense of like these are real people like dedicating their lives to this stuff. Um, but anyway, we're going to talk about uh, the notification structure of Dropbox, and here 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 goes. I don't know what this thing is doing. <laughs> okay, so yeah, this is kind of basically the premise. You have two computers. Um, one like zaps a change to Dropbox, so that's kind of easy, right? Like we can imagine how that happens, but. You know, how does this other computer get notified of this change? 
Um, there's many ways to solve this problem. Um, so one way to do it is just pull. So polling is easy. Everyone here probably knows how to do it. But essentially, you just kind of like sit in this loop, wait until some kind of code tells you if there are changes. Um, um, but they're pull even just given this uh, general model, there are still reasons why polling is bad. So number one, you know, latency is related to polling intervals. So the longer you wait to pull, or the bigger your uh, period is here, um, polling interval, um, the more latent. So the, the longer you have to wait for a, a con uh, some event to happen. Um, but the polling interval is also inversely proportional to the resources required. So basically, the more you pull, uh, the more resources you need. Um, or I'm sorry, yeah, so the longer you're pulling, the, the longer you're pulling your interval, the, sh the, the less you're pulling, the, more, the, um, the less resources you need. Um, the resources is, you know, inversely pro are proportional to cost, that's obvious. So what it comes down to is you can either have, very simple, but either you can pick low latency or low cost. So you're kind of like stuck there. Um, you know, you can you can have like you can have your, all your machines hitting Dropbox, you know, every hundred milliseconds or something. But then you just need a lot of like servers on the back end supporting that. Um, so and this is not even just this is just a per user cost. So this thing mo like scales the amount of users you have. Um, here's another kind of like mathy thing: um, number of users times cost of pull divided by intervals, like the total cost. Um, so this sucks. Uh, but before we talk about solu potential solutions, just, um, just you guys should just know some stuff about Dropbox. So first off, we use HTTP for all communication. Um, so everything from like all of our like I guess lower level uh -huh. kind of like sync protocols to um, all our RPCs between our servers, we, we use HTTP. And the reason why is that um, there's just a huge like body of pre-existing pre code that supports HTTP. So that's one thing people usually say that. Um, the reason I like the most is that firewalls tend to not block HTTP, so um, it's very important to us that people kind of like install Dropbox on their work computers, and it works without their IT admins disabling it. Um, so yeah, when I first got the Dropbox and I, I saw this, I was like, well, HTTP is a horrible protocol. Why are you using it? And it's like, these are the reasons. Um, another thing to know is that Dropbox is a log-structured file system. So essentially what this means is that all metadata, all bookkeeping is stored in a log um, or something that resembles a log. So this is, um, what I tried to do, to, to do here with this picture is that uh, every line, imagine, is some, some entry in a log. So basically, like, food.txt was edited, bar.txt was edited, food.txt was edited again, um, and so on and so on. So log-structured file systems tend to work well um, in situations where your, I guess, your storage medium has no penalty for random seeking. Um, so, you know, we assume that, too. Uh, so now we'll go into HTTP polling. So how, how does this work? Uh, so essentially what people do is you make a request and, um, and then you just get the response back. It's kind of simple. And you can imagine that on the, on the back end, this, uh, this changes uh, URL is like bound to some like piece of code that runs when changes is hit. Then we query some database and then, then we return everything's happy somewhat. So here's what's actually going on, right? Um, at the low level, and like I highlighted the kind of like the the resource used, but uh, essentially, the server makes a connection that takes up some network resources. Um, server has to read read the request um, that's network. Server has to parse and handle the request that's CPU, and then we need to query the database, um, which querying database could be over the network, but I'm just calling this uh, disk resources here. So, um, and it's also I try to put it in terms of like relative expense. So. Blue is like nothing because we have like, for what, more or less, we have like infinite amounts of CPU on the back end. Um, network is a little bit more, more, uh, more scarce, and disk space is uh, like the most scarce. Um, or not space, but IO bandwidth, I should say. Um, disks are just really, really slow. So I kind of highlighted it here. This is 100% this is true. If you don't believe me, we should fight later. But um, <laughs> um, if you just look at like relative speeds of like t t uh, across all these technologies, um, disk I.O. is definitely like the slowest. Um, not only is it seeking, like seeking randomly in a disk, but it's also just guess, like raw data transfer. Um, so we have to conserve this, because the more we conserve this, the more we can scale. Um, anyway, so now how do we solve this problem? So uh, I don't know if eventing is actually a term, but essentially the, the idea here is that instead of us pulling Dropbox, we do like the simple thing, where we just give Dropbox a mechanism to tell every client 
when a change happens. Um, so, so and then there's still also the case, like what if the client is offline while a change happens? Well, then you have to do a, a first a pull there. So um, I kind of have a little, a little hint, some foreshadowing about what we do. So basically what we do is we, we put some cache version of the database. We just cache the most necessary like, knowledge possible to like, support this kind of system. Um, so here's some more kind of like rationale behind why eventing is good. Um, instead of like just number of, instead of the system having to scale with the number of total users, we just have to scale with total active, active users. So um, you might have, we might have like tens of millions of computers connected to Dropbox every day, or just using, uh, just I guess the Dropbox program is on in their machines, but um, not all of them are actively syncing. So because that, that that proportion is so much smaller than the total number of users, we might want to build a system that scales around that because we'll just um, save a lot of costs that way. Um, right, so how do people do this stuff over HTTP? Because usually um, it seems like HTTP is, you, have to, you can only do polling. Well, there's like some hacks. They're not, I don't know how well, they, how well known they are, but essentially you, the idea is that you make a request and the server doesn't respond until um, something happens. So you just kind of like wait, sit there like, like blocking on that socket. Um, um, so if we're going to take this approach, which we are, because I kind of said that we use HTTP for everything, um, the implication here is that every client in the world um, will have an open connection to Dropbox. Um, so this is a massive number. It's, it's kind of interesting. So, so that's the case. We clearly have to build some server that can hold open connections that can just hang on HTTP requests. Um, but if we wanted to minimize the number of servers, I guess the first question we should ask is how many, how many open connections can one single machine support? So, so one, clearly, obviously not. I mean, we can do better. 10, maybe it's 10. Some, uh, back in the 90s, it was probably 10. Um, 100, 1,000, like where does it end? Like when do I stop pressing next and I just add a zero? Um, here. Uh, so it depends, like, <laughs> um, uh, I, so, like what, like, what actually limits this? Like, what is, like, the science around this? Like, what, uh, so if you start thinking about it, um, really depends on the context. It depends on, like, what your kind of, like, venting mechanism is, like, what each connection requires. requires. Um, but if you assume there's, like, no cost, you just make a connection and just hold it open, um, the, the cost will be memory. Um, so why is it memory? Well, you have, basically you have a structure in the kernel for every file script you have open, so that's some amount of memory, maybe like 100 bytes. You have a structure for every socket that's open as well, so that's maybe another 100 bytes. Um, you have a structure for all the socket buffers, then you have the application level structures. Um, so you can be kind of like very quantitative about this and actually say like how, how much memory from my computer is like a single connection taking. Um, anyway, just kind of like wanted to like establish that mode of thought. but. So we have not server. So this is kind of like our solution to this problem. It's essentially, uh, it's this crazy custom or like piece of code. It's all C++. Um, that doesn't mean it too much by itself. But, um, but basically, every machine on the not server system can support up to 2.6 million connections. So that's like mind blowing. Um, like so in 1999, this guy, Dan Kegel, kind of posed this question to the internet. That's when the internet was getting big. And he's like, we need to be able to make, make servers that support 10,000 connections, can we do it? Because at the time, no one was actually doing that. It was like maybe 100 concurrent connections. Um, so if you just compare that to, to today, or like what we've achieved, um, it's a couple orders of magnitude more. So it's pretty nuts. Um, it's not only due to kind of like, it's, it's a lot of things. Linux in 1999 was way, 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 way shittier than Linux in like 2012. So that's, that's kind of good in one way, like makes, means that there's progress being made in Linux itself. Um, by the way, how many people here use Linux? Okay, how many people here only use Linux? Oh wow, you guys are honest. <laughs> Everyone's gonna raise their hand again. It's like, <laughs> um, um, okay, how many people here use Ubuntu? Arch Linux. Oh, that's good. Uh, Debian. Debian unstable. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> Nice. Uh, Gen 2? Cool. Linux is by far the best operating system I've ever lived. Um, anyway. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, so you have like all these like hackers throughout the ages. So there's like um, who's like who would I call it, like the first? I mean, you just have like crazy people like Sussman, like uh, Eric S. Raymond, like uh, who else? Um, like Richard Stallman, and then like these guys are like super awesome. Um, and then out of nowhere, like Linus Torvalds like comes up. He's like, "Hey, I'm like 19. I'm like, gonna build this operating system. It's gonna like own all of you." Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then back, I, like back in the day, they were like, "Oh, this kid sucks." But like now, he's kind of like our, he's like our generation's like true hacker. Like this guy is like carrying the flag and like what you know we should be doing as hackers. So he's amazing. Um, anyway, so go back to Nod Server, we have about 10, 10 machines uh, doing all the traffic in Dropbox. So just to divide it out. Um, um, so we roughly have like six hundred k HTTP requests per second. So these are like these are requests just being made. Um, that aren't really, don't have like an active response, it's just they're just kind of being made uh, if there's a, an error, so, or something like that. Um, I can explain more in detail of that, but I'm just gonna gloss over it. Um, but we actually have 11K updates per second. So these are actual, this is actual um, people's Dropbox is changing every second, it's just 11K. So compare that to like millions, it's like in order of magnitudes. Um, uh, so that's, that's per machine, so we have 10, so we, we have about like 110, Basically, 100,000 people's Dropbox are changing every second. Um, that number is secret, don't tell anybody. But, um, <laughs> so each machine, they're pretty standard. This, these machines are but like, by no means like, like they're, maybe like, they're better than our desktops, but they're not like, m like government secret machines. They're like, it's two CPUs, uh, 12 cores total, six cores per CPU, 2.27 gigahertz, a lot of RAM, um, gigabit ethernet, nothing, pretty standard, yeah. Do you use Intel or AMD? Oh, we use Intel. Yeah. We also have hyperthreading turned off. <laughs> um, so there's uh, r lots of reasons why. Hyperthreading is one of these things that doesn't, MySQL just doesn't really work well with hyperthreading. Um, that's a random bit of knowledge. Um, it's, the, the, r the rough idea of the reason is that MySQL has a lot of its own lock uh, implementation. So it just has like a, a custom written spin lock, but spin locks don't work well with hyperthreading because you might have two on the same thing, they help hog each other, but whatever. Um, Anyway, this is the, kind of like the picture in your mind that you should think of when you think of not server. Um, so we have this completely like orthogonal thing that's like storing metadata for users. You know, I'm calling it the client metadata server. Uh, so essentially clients make, go to the server and say, hey, Dropbox, here are new changes on this person's computer. Um, it's not the raw data, it's just the metadata. This, think of this as just like uh, changing the bookkeeping um, for your file system. Um, so all those, all those machines go to this one other machine called the not proxy proxy. There's a good reason why it's called that. Um, <laughs> so we hit this machine and say, hey, this person's Dropbox has changed. The not proxy proxy um, then goes to every single uh, physical not server machine and says, hey, this person's Dropbox has changed. Um, we do that just to kind of limit the amount. So we have like, of these servers, we probably have like 100 to 200. Um, I don't know the exact number, but Joe probably does. Um, so we, you wouldn't want like, <laughs> 100 to 200 of these machines hitting, you know, 10, it's like, you know, it's like n times m. So we just basically all go to not proxy and then they, they like, it's kind of like it goes like in and it goes, it goes out. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think visuals are important um, to understanding this stuff. Uh, what's that? 137. Oh, 137. Wow, I was close. That's good. Um, so back in the day, back in the day, um, Back in the day of Dropbox, we had one, one metadata server, um, and that thing was a total piece of shit. Like that, <laughs> we still actually use that server to this day, which is sad for us, for other stuff. Anyway, so I'll talk about each of the components. Uh, so not proxy proxy, just super simple, brain dead server. Um, all it is, it takes the Dropbox information, uh, Dropbox update info, and just like uh, reforwards that out, at, that out all to other, all the other not proxies. Um, so the not proxy, like not server, is um, kind of like the special sauce here. So it's actually a couple different services if you look in here. It's like one physical machine, but there's kind of different um, processes going running in there. Um, so the two big ones are, are not the not proxy here, and uh, the not server here. Um, um, so anyway, you have like the not proxy, which is listening on the not proxy proxy end, and then you have the not servers, which are listening on the client end. Um, so essentially the way to communicate is that um, the data structure is we have this large in-memory array um, that basically every entry points to someone's Dropbox. 
And the number we store there is basically the last revision ID in that for their Dropbox. So it's kind of like the, I mentioned earlier, Dropbox is a log, log file system. So essentially, it's the pointer into that log that that client has, has like consumed up to, if that makes sense. Um, so this, this is, it's kind of neat because we just kind of like allocate, you know, we just do, essentially do like malloc of eight, eight gigabytes, and that works on machines with 24 gigabytes of memory. Um, um, so we do that, and then every, every specific machine actually shares its memory. So um, there are special incantations in Unix, uh, if you ever delve this deep into it, but this is a thing called shim open. So you shim open something, um, it's kind of like a file, it returns a file descriptor, but it's, it's really just pointing to the shared memory region, then you just mmap, the, mmap that into your process. Um, so basically, if not proxy listens to requests, um, updates this shared memory region, and then and then the not proxy pings all the all the not servers. The not servers then, once they get that ping, they check: is this is this user connected to me right now? Um, if so, is this user's ID um, up to date? Is this up to date with what's on uh, in this big shared memory region? If it is up to date, nothing happens. Just a no op. If it isn't, then we just send a message to that. Essentially, we send like the HTTP request to that client to wake them up. Um, I think I have some of that there. Um, there's one other kind of like component to this, which we, it's called the FD server. Um, so you have this issue when, when you have, essentially each of these guys has about like 260, 260K uh, connections open to it, like each server independently. Um, so you, you can't just easily, you can't just easily like just kill those processes because then you have, you're kind of like DDoSing yourself. You have about 260 clients all coming back at the same time um, trying to like re get this connection open and not server again. So if there's a bug and it crashes like seg faults, then that's bad. Um, also, if you're just like pushing code and you reset it, that's also not, you need to do something a little more sophisticated. Um, so you have this thing called the FT server, which super trivial, basically just has, it, it, it holds a reference to the listening socket. Um, so like port, port 80 on, you know, on the back end. And basically, when we want to restart a not server, um, we do this very simple kind of thing where um, we stop listening connections. And first, we stop listening connections. And then we tell every client to um, reconnect to not server. Um, so that when, by doing that, you basically have every client reconnecting, but it's going to a different not server. Um, so another interesting thing here is that uh, when, every, when a not server comes back up and when we restart it, the not server goes to the FT server and says, hey, can you give me the file descriptor for the listening socket so I can call accept on it? Um, so in Unix, you can actually like, like send file descriptors over the pipe, which is kind of interesting. Um, but the most interesting part of this is that we essentially rely on Linux to, to load balance uh, clients across all these different not server um, instances. So basically, they're all calling accept, and Linux decides which, which process gets the client. Um, um, you would think that Linux is actually fair in this, um, but it's, it's not. So what we tend to see happen is one not server will just accumulate way, way more connections than other ones by, by pure chance. It's something with the, the scheduler. Um, so we, have, we actually haven't patched Linux. I, I think that we, we might have to because it's, it's kind of fucked. But um, <laughs> well, well, yeah, so, I mean, this is another way to make it better. But what, what we end up doing is, um, I won't go here yet, but what we end up doing is that we actually have our own kind of load balancing mechanism. So when, the, when a single not server machine uh, uh, kind of notices that it's getting over, over host, it's like not really re re um, responding to people as fast as it should, it basically does the same thing. It stops listening to connections and it closes like excess clients. And then like it just, clients what by pure chance will just redistribute themselves amongst the other not servers. Um, but it's inter interesting to know about the accept. Um, so, so at a, <clears throat> just talking about concurrency, like how, does it, how do we actually implement the concurrency in every not server? So one way to do it is you just do a thread, a thread per connection, and then you just use a bunch of like blocking socket calls. Um, that, that tends to not scale. Um, so we, we don't know, like no one really knows this for sure anymore. It's actually a big debate because like I said, the Linux of 2012 is much different from the Linux of 1999. Um, we don't really know if like a thread per connection actually is a better uh, solution at this point, but no one tends to do it anyway. Um, just because there's kind of like this, the mid 2000s of people saying like ePoll is the way to do this. But essentially there's this call called ePoll where 
um, every NAS server is one thread, and it's just this way to kind of like implement like a, I guess like an, an event-based an event-based program. You basically pass the epoll all the clients, all the file descriptors, all the clients you're interested in and listening to, and then epoll if none of them are in a ready state, if none of them have information to to give to the server, it will just block indefinitely. Um, if there isn't information, then it just returns which file descriptors are available, and then you kind of have a little loop in there that says, okay, what, what handlers or what internal structures are mapped to each, what file descriptors, and let me just kick off that event handler. Um, so that's essentially how it works. Uh, I hope I didn't make it too complicated, because it's really not. Um, but like I said, memory is key here, so essentially, you know, we just want to mim limit the number of random structures and, and buffers that we use per connection. Um, so we do have a pretty aggressive level in the app code, but um, you know, so there's, we don't use OpenSSL. Like, not server stuff isn't encrypted only because it doesn't have to be. The only information that's get, getting propagated through the wire is just like Dropbox. Dropbox is active or Dropbox is not active, which is which is kind. Of, I mean, you, you could there could be an argument there saying that that's maybe sensitive information, but we um, the trade-off is just, just not enough for us to go in the other direction. But um, but yeah, uh, we have to start thinking about you know what. You know, what memory is being taken up by the kernel, and then how do we reduce that also? Um, but right now we're fine because we can, uh, at peak, we can support 2.6 million. I think that's more than enough. We only have 10 servers doing this stuff. Um, but we currently only have about 1.7 million clients per, for each machine. Um, so just kind of like to bring this point, like, you know, back down to earth. Um, so this is like the actual structure in Linux uh, for a file. And this is, you know, this is just one. But if we wanted to play this kind of like thought experiment, um, you know, if we did have 24 gigabytes, what's the theoretical limit? Well, if you divide it out, you get about 230 million clients per machine. Um, so that's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Um, there's nothing really stopping you aside from that. Right, right now, the, the, our servers aren't hosed on CPU at all. Um, I think they're about like roughly about like 25% utilization, Joe would know. He's going to SSH in one right now, um, <laughs> and, and he'll tell us. But yeah, the, um, the utilization actually isn't high. It's like way lower than it should be. So we, we have a lot to spare in CPU. Um, so right now, it's more like load, uh, number of people actually connecting to Dropbox, and just like stuff like this. 85% um, idle. 85% idle, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy stuff. Um, so there's some there's some other like kind of like gotchas uh, things we learned along the way. Um, so there's this Synac retries oh god Synac retries thing. So um, <clears throat> this is also goes into like the kernel buffers. Uh, I don't know how much you guys want to know about this stuff, but essentially when a TCP connection is made, um, a client sends a syn packet, then the server sends a syn ack packet back down. Then when the client sends another ack again, then the connection is established. Um, but what sometimes happen is, happens is that a server will send a synac, and then the client won't send an ack back. So then you have like essentially all these like uh, I guess like in-flight connection objects in the kernel. Um, so you you could in theory uh, like DOS someone by just sending a bunch of sins to the machine and never sending an ack back, and then the, the kernel buffers will overflow waiting for that waiting for the acts. Um, so we have to we have to turn that down a little bit and say we don't, we're only going to do one retry. Because uh, most sorry, most good clients tend to not um, not send ACK backs. Um, so after one we try, the server will just say like screw this connection. This guy's like an attacker or something. Um, so the TCP max sin backlog. So there's another there's another uh, there's another kind of like uh, I guess mitigation techniques for avoiding these kind of DOS attacks at the sin ACK level. Um, there's this thing called sin cookies. So if you <clears throat> if you have like if you have more than um, in this case, if you have more than 1280 uh, different, uh, different connections in the kernel waiting for an ACK back, uh, instead of allocating, um, instead of allocating like a new structure for that, that, synac, that synac pattern, what the kernel start doing is it does something called like syn cookies. So essentially this is trading memory for CPU here. So we actually, it, what it starts doing is it encodes all the, inform all the information necessary to make the connection um, in the packet itself. So when the client sends an act back, the kernel doesn't have, won't have needed to store like a, an entry in, in its table. Um, so this actually doesn't, it's a, it's a neat hack for TCP. You should read about it sometime, but it doesn't work in all situations. Um, so we have to, we just set that really high because 
there are proxies out there that completely screw send cookies. Um, so we, we had to set that pretty high too. Um, another thing is that there's a global, a global file descriptor limit. So across the entire kernel, uh, or the, the, all the processes. So here we set it to three million. Um, but um, there's also a, a per process file descriptor limit. You have to, that's, you have to set that via U limit. Um, yeah, so I also mentioned this, but like we have to do self self load balancing. So the accept call, we can't rely on Linux to kind of like load balance connections across not servers fairly. Um, so we do this like song and dance where we like send a heartbeat to ourselves. If it doesn't come back soon enough, then we we just kind of like start uh, I guess like losing losing connections slowly. Um, and another cool gotcha was that. Um, these, this is actually not purely long pulling. We do we are long pulling in the sense that like a, we just make a request and wait. Um, the clients actually read redo the request every sixty seconds. Um, this is because so there is some there's some actual pulling going on, and the reason is that um, a lot of proxies, if you just do a long pulling more than sixty seconds, it'll just close the connection and assume it's bad. So uh, it, this was literally the timeout was literally sent to ninety seconds. Um, and then we kind of like we started logging some of this data. We noticed that a lot of clients were just like timing out, um, and we figured out it was because of this random 60-second time uh, timeout set by a lot of proxies. So we set it to 55, 55 seconds, and we noticed that this was uh, we were dropping a lot less clients. Um, so that's that's like the professional story. What actually happened is that there was a Dropbox or a, in a hotel room, and they couldn't connect to Dropbox, um, and that was because of this reason. Um, Anyway, so there's some history. So originally there was no not server. Dropbox was started without a not server. This was actually um, not server was actually somebody's project um, that they decided that this was a way to like make the system faster. But um, what the what the client would do is that it would just pull, um, you know, with some interval. And we you know we originally thought that that was like the only way we can really do it. Um, but then we wrote the first not server to kind of fix this issue. It was written in Python. Um, it used twisted, and it was just it, like at a certain point, it just wouldn't scale anymore. Um, this was all due. To, there's two reasons why. Number one, um, number one, twisted is not that great. Uh, so, oh, okay. so usually I speak at like I spoke at PyCon once, and I said this, and, and that was bad. Um, um, but the other reason is that Python is also slow. Sorry. <laughs> um, so the, the problem is that. Um, you know, this loop, like this, this top level event loop that you're doing the e poll. So I think Twisted it was still doing like select or something really weird at that point. So, so the select call as an analog to e poll is like very slow. Um, because it, instead of doing, uh, instead of like scaling with the number of active file descriptors, it actually scales with the total number of file descriptors you're watching. So you basically are like, paying this cost of like n every time around the event loop. But um, so I think it was using select, it's also using Python. So Python's then iterating through everything, all your connections. Um, and iterating in Python is very, very slow. Um, the other thing is that Python just like has a lot of bloat per connection. So there's like all these like random like objects going on. Um, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, like you couldn't scale past 5,000 connections. It would just die. So that's when we kind of realized we need to do something a little smarter. Um, so the first one was written in C++. Uh, not so was interesting, because uh, the person who wrote it first wrote in C++ and um, I don't know. At the time, I hated C++. I like it now. But I was like, C++ is horrible. Why are you doing this? So then we, like, we rewrote it to be just pure C. Um, I think he did it just for fun. Um, but then later on, like, people, we, new people started who like, knew C++ better. And so they started adding C++. So it was like C++ to C, C++ again. It's weird. Um, another thing is that, uh, so the FT server is like a relatively new addition, too. So we. Um, so the, the first not server was kind of written, um, had bugs for a couple, th like three weeks, like weeks or a month. I think it was iterated on like very quickly. Um, and then we just never changed it. So we never had this issue of like what happens when we need to restart a not server because it was just perfect. Um, so when, when it finally had, so that's kind of, that's kind of funny. But like later on, um, we actually had to add things and then we, we needed this FD server thing to kind of like great, handle graceful restarts. Um, but yeah, the, um, basically the, the person was like, oh, I need to make this change to not server. What happens if I restart? And 
the person who wrote Nasher was like, I don't know. <laughs> um, figure it out. Um, anyway, so that's the Nasher stuff. Um, I hope I've, uh, hope you guys have learned something from this talk about basically what to avoid and like taking the quickest route to building like a highly scalable system. Um, we took the long meandering route and um, definitely recommend that if you want to learn. But um, if you ever have someone that's like, you know, we need to build like a super like massive like high connection, like high concurrency system, you, you guys essentially know the, the ins and outs of it. So, so that's good. Anyway, let's talk about engineering Dropbox for a little bit. Um, so you guys get a better sense of like how this, how this organization works from the inside. Um, so we have about, I think we have 10 engineering teams at this point. Um, quickly run through them. So we have a client team. So this team is um, a single group of people writing software that works across every version of Windows, um, every version of Mac from 10.4 and up, um, every version of Linux. So the only thing we require on the Linux end is just a 2.6 kernel. We package the entire user land. Um, so then, not only that, but it's, it's all these, like, not, it's, like, these three operating systems, and it's like every version of every operating system. But then we also need to support like every random file system on these, oper on, on these operating systems. So you have like FAT32 on, on Windows, NTFS on Windows. Um, quite honestly, not too, much, not too much else there. On Mac, you have like HFS, HFS Plus, HFS Plus case sensitive. Linux, Linux is like a grab bag of like whatever. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so you have people on Riser, on XFS, like X4, BetterFS, and we actually do fix these issues. There's actually a guy running a Dropbox, or there's a lot of guys actually running Dropbox on, 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 uh, on like this user space uh, NTFS implementation. It's called NTFS 3G. So these are people that want to mount their like Linux. They dual boot Linux and Windows for some reason, and they want to mount their Windows partition. Um, and that thing doesn't support every. That doesn't support every kind of. Uh, every kind of like system call, so you support that too. Um, the nice thing about supporting the, all these platforms, it, it just makes the client so rock hard and like really nice from an internal design point of view. So I used to be on the client team, so I just uh, like to talk about it. Server, the server team basically is responsible for just like scaling the system. So they do stuff like, okay, uh, we have this like issue with non-server. Well, we have to rewrite this infrastructure. Um, they also do a lot of like the day-to-day -day kind of like monitoring and like seeing where the next bottlenecks are going to be. And sometimes it's a little tweak, sometimes it's a massive rewrite. Um, but it's pretty crazy. We have the, the sheer number of data going, into, going in and out of Dropbox is so high um, that you need kind of like some of these like clever, clever tricks. Um, I think we're building the best website in the world only because we're, we kind of like always have all these cool opportunities to use HTML5 and like new J JavaScript stuff. Um, but you know we're gonna have like a, basically like a music player in the web one day. We're gonna have like this really cool photos app in the web one day. Um, probably something with docs. Um, and I, I, I just think it's it, it's it's an opportunity to build like a real like desktop application inside the web, which few people are actually doing right now. Um, then we have a mobile team. So this is basically, um, you know, what does Dropbox on mobile look like? So what it looks like today is much different from what we want it to look like. Um, so who here uses Dropbox on Android or iPhone? So what does it remind you of the most? What is what kind of program have you used in the past that's like it? it kind of reminds me of like the Windows 3.1 file manager. Um, yeah. so like here are my files. Um, so yeah, it's so helpful to just look through files. I know. <laughs> it's like it's like what I spend most of my time doing. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, so I mean, that, that's okay, that's like the first approximation of what someone wants from like a Dropbox mobile app. But there's just so much more we can do there. Um, um, so that's really interesting. Um, analytics, we just kind of like basically the goal of the analytics team is to understand our users and understand like the, all the metrics around the business. So um, we kind of have like this huge, so much more. We actually have more data in analytics than there is in the core service. Um, and there's kind of like there's on one, one one side you have like these kind of like system level raw like distributed system scaling issues so just that but on the other other end you have like a more data science so like how do we understand like build models around this and then um, make it efficient to like like um, derive this information online um, so that's why analytics team is cool uh, API team so API is like the future of Dropbox. Um, we're trying to you know figure out what's the best way um, to like give developers like access to people's Dropbox, and um, 
build cool things on top of Dropbox. So that's really cool. Payments, we have like half of a person working on this. So um, I thought I'd mention it because it's pretty cool. Um, so mo most engineers don't tend to write things like payment systems, but um, it, 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 ha it has some of like, it's one of the most critical systems at Dropbox because if it fails, we don't make money and then we die. <laughs> um, so, um, so we have like half of a person kind of like, you know, r essentially running the system through which all money in Dropbox goes in and out. Um, it's pretty interesting. Um, we have like, these are newer teams, but we have like a Teams team. So um, the Teams team is focused on building Dropbox for Teams. Um, so they kind of like, they kind of work across, they're kind of like a cross-functional team, so they tend to work on web, they tend to like think of things for client. Um, this is mostly kind of like a, uh, I don't know, what do I call it? It's like your security parachute. I don't know. If you need, we, we have like Teams customers, they want extra features. So um, I love the Teams team. Uh, we have a growth team. So this is growth hacking. So growth hacking is this thing that came from Facebook. Um, I would say popularized through Facebook. Um, essentially, having a team dedicated to just getting as many users on the service as possible. Um, it's relatively new. We're just trying it out. But um, um, Usually, in like internet, a lot of internet companies are trying to do this now, where they have like one growth team mostly focused on like uh, initial experience stuff, like onboarding. And you have another team that's just focused on the core product. Um, so, if you guys have ever like been to Twitter.com, like the front page of Twitter is actually um, managed by the growth team. And, like once you get inside, then everything's managed by like the the actual product team. So, um, they're kind of an analytical team, so they tend to like measure stuff, do A/B tests. Uh, uh, Stuff like that. Um, then we have like we want a consumer electronics team, right? So um, there's so much more. There's so many more devices that Dropbox should be on, like on your car, on your like Xbox, on your Wii, um, maybe your toaster, <laughs> maybe. Your, um, I mean, this is not totally far. Like once we kind of like the. Well, I'll get into this, but like once Dropbox is an enabling technology, then you can ask questions like, what if I wanted to build like an awesome oven that like cooked stuff automatically for people? Um, it's, it's like a data issue because there's just no infrastructure that gives people that like option from the from on the first hand. Um, so we have about 60 engineers, uh, nearly 100 million users. Um, I actually don't know how many users we have, um, but something like that. Um, so you can kind of see like every engineer basically is. If you divide this out linearly, we kind of every engineer is like responsible for like you know, I don't know, one out of six, 100, 10 over six people. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm more of like a, a linguistics person. I, I'm not so much of a math person. Um, so, so why Dropbox? So I kind of like touched upon this stuff originally, but like already. But we want to be the file system of, of the internet, just like point blank. Um, the internet doesn't have a file system. It doesn't have like a central system that everybody uses to communicate with each other. So the analog here is like, if you look at, if you just look at your one computer, um, like your Windows PC, the file system is kind of where all the apps share and exchange data. And so a similar thing doesn't exist for the internet, like on a macro scale. Um, and that's what we want to be. Um, essentially, the implication here is that you have instantaneous data transfer across, you know, all devices that um, exist, all services, and all people. Um, that just doesn't really exist in an easy way right now. So like one kind of like, one kind of like a, I guess like use case or like product case is like you take a picture on your camera, it's like instantly goes on your TV at home. Maybe someone's like watching TV and they say like, hey, someone took a picture in your Dropbox. Or, or all your friends like on Facebook see it instantly and you didn't really have to do anything. It's just kind of like once you set up the, the controls and like how like your data propagates, it just happens automatically with, without any worrying or like manual labor. Um, so we're trying to do for data what email did for communication, just completely change and like make it so much faster, um, like change the expectations people have for communication. So like, you know, bef before email, you know, people sent out like memos in the workplace, and like only a certain amount of memos would reach certain people. But now you have like emails, like radically change the way people do their work. Um, the same with Dropbox. Um, you know, you, you put a, the the time between creating a file and like getting it distributed to people is like so much. Uh, lower with Dropbox. Um, and then basically you have like your data available everywhere. It's like backed up forever. Um, so we're also platform agnostic. So we don't care. Um, we don't really care what platform we're building for as long as it has, as long as we're like, it's 
it has Dropbox. So uh, people tend to ask me, oh, what, you know, how's Dropbox doing? Like, where's it going? Are you guys worried about like, like Google? And the answer is yes, I'm worried about Google and I'm worried about Apple. I'm worried about all these people. But the, and there are a lot of reasons why, you know, Dropbox has a fighting chance of like actually becoming the fellow system of the internet. But um, one of the big reasons is that we're just platform agnostic. So Google is going to always, you know, pimp out the Google platform. Um, and Apple is always going to pay with the Apple platform, but um, we we don't have like inherent kind of like uh, interest in these platforms. So um, it's actually better for us the more platforms there are, um, and that's no secret. That's no secret to anybody. So um, it's just kind of like our inherent advantage as a company, um, and it's cool too because we have like teams working across all these different competing platforms, and all, it's like good to share this knowledge. Um, you know, Dropbox on the PC is architected way differently from Dropbox on the iPhone because you have a different kind of like you know, operating constraints. Um, yeah, we're just getting started. There's, I mean, hopefully I've communicated to you guys how much like potential like things there are to do. Um, but you know, we, the, fact of the, matter is, the fact of the matter is we just need a lot of people to do it. Um, we basically have like 10 over six, you know, million people. <laughs> but it's like the number's way too large. <laughs> All right, <laughs> five gigabytes. Who knows what 10 over six is? Just kidding. <laughs> it's a joke. Um, so please, uh, if you guys have have the time, you should work at Dropbox. Um, it's cool. It's a cool place. Um, you know, these things don't really matter to me as much. Um, you know, whatever. But what really matters is that you're just like hungry and you like like coding. You like building stuff um, because that's ultimately what's going to like take us to the next level. Um, so, oh, whoops. What am I doing? So that's it. Um, hope you guys enjoy the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we can do questions if there are any questions. Ask anything. Yeah. Yeah. So the 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 system as is is mostly built uh, horizontally. So it's not. Um, it's not voodoo magic when we look, look into the future in terms of scaling, but um, things change about what we're building. So uh, I guess the easiest way to put this is um, the most naive Dropbox system, um, you can scale it very easily. You just say you have one server for every one computer, and it's, like a, it's mostly like a shared nothing type of like backend, right? Um, but the more sh data sharing you have between users, the more intense the scaling challenges are, because you have like these issues of con uh, like consistency and distributedness. Um, so, you know, one thing we, one thing like one thing that's big for us is in the future people are sharing lots of data through Dropbox, and that will kind of like change the nature of our, our scaling, like how we scale the system. Um, so it's just it's unclear. Like for every new feature that we build, that's that's when the scaling challenges come. There's no inherent scaling challenge, scaling scaling challenge today. Um, I actually don't know what files are shared the most. I would probably say photos. I would say photos. I know that photos tend to be stored more, and I would, I would just assume just by correlating that that we probably shared the most too. Yeah, that was like a year. That was like a year and a half ago or something. Um, so it's a pretty heavy question. Uh, <laughs> I say, what can I say for this? Thirty seconds, please. Yeah. Um, how's the security of Dropbox? Uh, so we take security very seriously. Um, first, uh, yeah. Did you guys watch the presidential debates? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I want to say that we, we take it very seriously. We actually, um, we have a couple of folks dedicated full time to security um, for what that's worth. I don't think that's what actually builds a very strong security organization, but it helps. Um, the, the, I think the biggest thing, I guess what you're kind of asking is like, why did these security leaks happen in some sense? And 
Um, my best response to you is that uh, like people at Dropbox aren't like idiots. Like it, it wasn't kind of like a, I would say when you're building something and you're kind of like going doing a lot of things in many different directions, uh, you get blindsided. Um, and another core thing about like computer security, um, or maybe just product security, is that it's all about like expectations and um, so what we expect, what the company expects or what the engineers expect to be secure um, may be mismatched with what users expect from the system. Um, so uh, one, one, um, one example is that we don't do, we don't do client-side encryption. So we use one, one key to secure everyone's data before we store it on our servers. Um, so people tend to think of that as a security hole because that means that in theory Dropbox can read your passwords or your data. But that's a lockdown key, so like a very privileged few people can like actually do that. Um, obviously, that's not. It's, it's obviously we don't like read your files, right? Like that would be like really stupid. But um, but the whole it's like more expectations. Like the fact that like most people don't care, but there are some people who are like that's really bad, and they wouldn't use Dropbox, and they probably shouldn't. Um, or they should. What they should do is like store their data in Dropbox already encrypted, um, which kind of makes more sense to me. Because why would you have application, an application managing keys for you if you don't trust it in the first place? So it's, security is like a very like, it's like kind of like an onion. <laughs> um, it's very layered. So like maybe like you're here in the onion, but someone else is here in the onion, and you just have different kind of like expectations of security. Um, another thing that happened with us, so the, the password thing is obviously not an expectation issue, but another security hole in Dropbox was that, um, um, so what was, what was the issue? So we would store the, the access token for your account uh, unencrypted on your local disk. And the reason why is because we assumed if someone has physical access to your computer, you're already hosed from a data standpoint, um, right? <laughs> so like what, what's, what, what's actually, what is, what is Dropbox trying to secure? It's trying to secure your data. But so you don't, even if we store that thing encrypted, someone could just look in your Dropbox folder and read all your files anyway, right? Um, so, what's that? Yeah. So that that that's the so the 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 gist there was like that the attack the the kind of like uh, the threat was that um uh, you go on someone's computer it's very nuanced you go into, like let's say I go to your computer I'm like hey dude like I, I need to, like check the internet but I actually run a quick program that like steals your access token and then I sends it to my computer so that that transfer takes you know maybe like one second. Um, so I only need access to your computer for a very short amount of time to get access to your, all your Dropbox files indefinitely. Um, so that was like, you know, that was one sense you can say, you know, physical security, physical computer security is, is a, like obviously like a lost cause. Um, but then you have all these people who expect it, expect these other types of, types of things. So um, hopefully I didn't dig myself in too deep of a hole. But, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we obviously care about security. We do, we do like all these security reviews now, which is good. Um, um, but it also kind of like you need, you kind of have a holistic approach to it. You can't just say this has to be the most secure thing ever because you also have to consider the product trade-offs. Um, and that's just the way it is. I mean, we're always, we're never going to like sacrifice like the core, the core expectations that we we think that we're providing to people, which is we're not going to let people see, see your data or like untrusted parties. But you yeah. know. People, you didn't give explicit access to your Dropbox. Well, like, oh, man, it's going crazy. Um, <laughs> uh, so we, uh, so yeah, so uh, you know, they have to give us a subpoena and a warrant. Um, so, but that's just the case with anything, right? like any, any internet service. If you have data you don't want the government to read. You know, so you put it in like an encrypted container. Um, even if you do that, the government can still say we need to access your keys, and if you don't give it to us, you know, you're violating, violating the law. So um, it's definitely a new age uh, of you know computing and data and privacy and stuff like that. So um, there's no it, so you have all this like technology that kind of like wraps it all, but then you have all these like social social issues going on around that as well, um, and then you have like, expectations so like that too.
Um, so uh, how hard would it be for us to provide? How much have you do already? Are you saying like what's the re reliability of your data in Dropbox? Is that? Um, so we store everything, all the raw data. Okay, so all the metadata is essentially like triplicated. So we have three copies of your metadata at any point in time. All of your data is stored in S3. So S3 provides us like nine nines of like reliability. So, you know, one in a billion, one in a trillion, there's one in, one in a trillion chance that your data could be lost. But that's you know, obviously much much lower than like the the probability you get hit by like lightning or something. So, um, that's yeah, that's kind of like how the system is reliable. Oh, that's a good question. Um, we use, so we use something called pylons. Um, so pylons is the ancestor of what is now known as Pyramid. Um, it's written by this guy named Ben Bangert. Um, he's a Pythonista. Um, pylons is, our web framework is, our web stack is so vastly, you know, evolved differently from pylons. So we say we have pylons, but that's, it's like our own specific crazy thing at this point. Um, but yeah, essentially everything's in Python, um, and uh, we we use um, we have our own templating system on the web. Uh, we have this kind of like a, we use a combination of like prototype and um, and one other JavaScript thing. Um, but yeah, yeah. Do you have any? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so. <clears throat> we'll, we'll, we'll open source anything that's not core to Dropbox, or like not core core offering, like even if it's still technologically like uh, valuable in some sense. So, um, so we wrote this MySQL proxy thing, um, which actually almost everybody who run, uses MySQL needs in some sense. Um, the problem is that you have like a hundred and something servers, you know, all hitting, you know, n different MySQL machines or database servers. And then what ends up happening is like the more servers you have on the front end, the number of connections that those MySQL machines have to have open is just gets higher. Um, and MySQL really doesn't like more than like 100 connections, like really doesn't like that. So what you need is like a MySQL proxy. So they all go to the proxy. It's like they go in, then they go out. Um, <laughs> it's like it's this common theme in computer science. I don't know why. It's like abstraction. It, um, but uh, so that's something that's like actually considered very, very valuable. Um, that we we are considering uh, open sourcing. Um, th that said, we have a GitHub too, so there's already a bunch of stuff that we've open sourced. Um, but we're in general, we're pretty we're pretty open to that as long as it's not like a competitive advantage. Um, and I can explain more about that stuff if you're curious. Yeah. How do you deal with the? Uh, so yeah, when we first started, I actually asked this question. Um, so essentially. The DMCA kind of like there's a set of rules that allows you to run an internet service, and basically one of them is that if there's a takedown request, you just have to take take it down from your service and make sure that no one else ever like violates the copyright again, something like that. So um, so that's what we do. Uh, basically, people come to us and say, "Take this data off Dropbox," and we just do that. Um, Yeah, yeah. It's it's the public folder always, yeah. So so can you actually take things out of Dropbox? Uh <laughs> can we uh I mean we what we don't we, so what we end up doing is we um ban it from being publicly shared. That's that's all we really have to do. Um so we don't we, we tend not to touch people's Dropboxes because that would be really weird. Um but <laughs> um, I wouldn't use a service that did that, that's kinda of strange, yeah. Yeah, so, you, so the question is, if I get this, is do, we, do we do large scale analysis? Let's say, let's say the government, you know, you know, the
<clears throat> so I think anything that's outside of a standard subpoena uh, or warrant, we would we'd probably fight uh, legally. Okay. Um, so we, uh, he, like Dropbox is kind of like at the forefront of this whole like storing your personal data in the cloud thing. So um, we actually have like, we actually rely on our lawyers to kind of like make strides in this way to like for use of privacy. So, you know, I don't, if there was like a gnarly request like, hey, like we need you to search everyone's Dropbox for child porn, we would definitely not do that. Um, so, yeah. <laughs>